Dr. Wayne Rossiter is an assistant professor of biology at Waynesburg University in Pennsylvania, but he's professionally known for his striking conversion to Christianity. Dr. Wayne Rossiter was a staunch and cantankerous atheist, and most of his graduate, undergraduate and graduate education afterwards, after that, he experienced a Saul to Paul conversion in the winter of 2008. Dr. Rossiter is now a deacon at his church, and he is also a traveling speaker in support of creationism. He said that growing up, he occasionally attended church, but in less than a year, the biology courses he was taking removed any convictions he had about church, about God, and about creation. He received a master's in zoology from Ohio State where he studied the evolution of rattlesnake venoms. He later earned a Ph.D. in ecology and evolution from Rutgers University. But Rossiter's conversion occurred when his wife one night asked him a question, and his qu her question was, if you look at your assumptions, where will they go? If you look at the assumptions you have about evolution, where will they go? He said he stayed up all night long looking at those, and he realized that all of his assumptions about evolution were completely and morally bankrupt. He wrote in the early hours of the morning, If molecules led to cells, and cells to organs, and organs to bodies, then the molecules to man hypothesis was true. We really were just wet computers responding to external stimuli in mechanical and unconscious ways. No soul, no consciousness. We are just machines, and I have been completely and utterly devastated. Now, this man who was an evolutionist has now published a book entitled Shadow of Oz, Theistic Evolution and the Absent God. And in that book, he defends his more recent view of creation and Christianity. Rossiter says that while his conversion to Christianity did not drive him away from science or intellectual or academic pursuits, that he is now a remade work in progress and he desires to live a more active and overtly Christian life. He recently turned down a teaching opportunity at a very prestigious West Coast school because of their requirements that their biology and science professors are required to teach evolution. And he said, I no longer believe in evolution, so therefore I cannot support any university that teaches it. This turncoat atheist said it was not science that caused him to doubt his atheism. Instead, what he saw as the consequences of atheistic science caused him to suddenly fall into the Savior's arms. You know, I think we enjoy hearing and reading about those who maybe even opposed Christianity at one time, but they now have enlisted into the ranks of following Jesus Christ. Today's sermon is the last sermon in the series of, we're doing about TVCC values, and it is We Value Stories of Life Change. Now, there's a word you sometimes might hear when referring to growing as a Christian, and it is the word transformation. Transformation is moving from your current state into a future state. In other words, it is growing in your faith in Jesus Christ and seeing your life change because of the presence of the Holy Spirit that lives within you. It's much like the physical transformation of a caterpillar that suddenly becomes a butterfly. So from the outset, I want to remind us all that transformation occurs differently for each one of us in our walk with Jesus Christ. Some transformation is going to be more dramatic than others. Some spiritual births are going to be more dramatic than others. If an expectant mother's first child is delivered naturally and her second child is delivered surgically through a C-section, she does not question if one birth is more legitimate than another. They both produced a vibrant, healthy expression of life that occurred from conception and gestation. So I want us to see today a story of life change in the Bible and notice an example, an exception, and some expectations. There is an example of a dramatic life change story in Scripture. The most dramatic conversion to Jesus Christ in the Bible is that of who we know primarily as the Apostle Paul. He had originally been hostile towards Jesus Christ, even towards the idea of Jesus Christ, and he'd been very hostile towards the followers of Jesus. I want you to turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 9. 
Acts chapter 9 in the New Testament. The book of Acts is a history of the early church, and the majority of the last part of the book of Acts is about the Apostle Paul and his impact, his impact upon the church, but first the impact that Jesus Christ had on him. In Acts 9, beginning at verse 1, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. Now, Saul would have been one that you might have met in the first century, and you would have been unimpressed with his spiritual potential. He did everything he could to stop the growth of Christianity. Luke, the writer of the book of Acts in the New Testament, repeats Saul's conversion experience three times. It's in Acts 9 that we're reading. It's later in Acts 22. It's later in chapter 26. And no other incident in the Bible has that kind of exposure other than the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. Now, if you skip on down about 18 verses, go down to verse 19 of Acts 9. It says, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. This man who had been threatening to kill Christians is now suddenly spending time with them. This man who wanted letters to remove any Christians from the synagogues was now preaching Jesus in these very same places. This man who wanted to imprison Christians because of their faith now shared a freedom from Jesus Christ that he had never experienced elsewhere. So what happened in those 16 verses that changed Saul? What changes occurred that transformed him so drastically? Now, we know there was a physical change. You know, nothing gets our attention more than a sudden physical change that occurs within our bodies, and maybe we have a scare. Maybe it's a health scare, or maybe we have an accident, and our physical body is suddenly affected. Look down at chapter 9, verse 3. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, he fell to the ground and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute, you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but they did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and he did not eat or drink anything. You know, to suddenly lose one's eyesight would be a horrible experience. For your whole life, up to that point, you had been independent, and then suddenly you are now dependent on someone to literally lead you around. In a few days, Saul regained his eyesight, but a lot of Bible scholars think that was Paul's thorn in the flesh that he writes about later in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, that he probably lost a huge part of his vision, that God had humbled him in that particular way, and that that physical handicap would keep Paul humble the rest of his life. But the most notable occurrence was a spiritual change that occurred in Saul's life. Look at verse 11. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he's done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Now, this means that Saul was going to have to admit that he was wrong all along about Jesus Christ. And instead of denying Jesus, he was now going to have to embrace Jesus. Instead of trying to come up with arguments against Christ, now he was going to be defending Christ. Paul is really known as the intellectual apostle. But initially, his intelligence blinded him to the truth, but later that same intellect would be used to write about 25% of what we know as the New Testament. Verse 17 says, Then Ananias went to the house and entered it, placing his hands on Saul. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord, Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you are coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. Notice that baptism was Saul's initial response to Jesus Christ. The very first thing he did when he learned who Jesus really was, was to be baptized. It was a sign of Saul's humility. It was a sign of Saul's acceptance of Jesus Christ. It was the point in time where he could look back and later retell his story. And when he retells his conversion, this is what he said was told to him by Ananias. And it occurs in Acts twenty-two sixteen. 16. He says, now what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name. Now there are some examples of some dramatic life change stories throughout history. If you grew up in the 70s like I did, the name Alice Cooper is known to you. Alice Cooper was a rock star. There's a picture you haven't seen in a while probably. Last, it looked like a couple of you coming in this morning. Just looking. Last year, he played the role of King Herod in NBC's Jesus Christ Superstar. But Cooper has credited his Christian faith and a one-on-one relationship with Jesus for saving him from alcoholism. Because 37 years ago, he was warned by his doctors to stop drinking and that he'd better change his life. A horrible physical issue caused by his drinking eventually led him to a change spiritually. Alice Cooper now writes, My wife and I are both Christians. My father was a pastor. My grandfather was an evangelist. I grew up in the church, went as far away as I could from it, almost died, then came back to the church. He says now he finds time for his daily Bible study. He attends church every Sunday, and he is very grateful that his children have had no problems with drugs or alcohol. The written testimony of this person starts, My name is Delmar Boring. I've suffered from anxiety and depression most of my life, which led me to trying to self-medicate with alcohol. Now, Delmar, one of our members now, has shared with me about his drinking and how it almost killed him and how it became a very self-destructive behavior. And he shared how many people had had him on their hearts and those that God had placed in his life had prompted a change in him. He writes, I just kept making excuses about going to church. The church TVCC was having an event, a murder mystery dinner. I remember thinking, what kind of church has something like that? And I thought to myself, I should check it out. I kept putting off getting tickets to the event, and I gave up on it. But he said when one afternoon a person had asked him if he got his tickets, and he told them no, maybe he'd do it the next time. But they proceeded to tell him that somebody had bought tickets, couldn't go, and wanted him to have them. He writes, I broke down in tears. I went to the mystery dinner, had an amazing time. Everyone made me feel so welcome. I decided to attend church that coming Sunday. That would be one of the best decisions of my life. I started to attend church every Sunday. A few months down the road, I decided to give my life to the Lord and be baptized. It was the most amazing and emotional day of my life. The Holy Spirit was definitely in the church that day. The congregation cheered and clapped as I came out of the water, a new man of God. I have given up alcohol that consumed my life for so many dark years. I give all the glory to God. I'm no longer a prisoner of my self-destructive ways. My journey continues. Keep inviting people to church and do not give up. Looking back, if it wasn't for the people not giving up on me, I am sure I would be dead. Don't stop planting that seed and leading others to Christ. You might be saving someone's life. What a testimony he's sitting right over here this morning. So, Absolutely. But we need to realize this type of conversion is often an exception. This type of dramatic conversion is often an exception. David Faust in his book, and also was the former president of CCU, his book Growing Churches, Growing Leaders writes about what he calls the struggles of a cradle Christian. It's those who have been Christians basically all of their life. Maybe you are a cradle Christian. From the time you were born, you were just always in church. But in that book, he writes that even cradle Christians have their doubts and their challenges and their temptations as well. David Faust lists four challenges you may have if your conversion experience was not as dramatic as the Apostle Paul's, that it was just based on your upbringing. He says the first challenge is the doubting dilemma, the doubting dilemma. He says a person raised in the church might begin wondering if their faith is really their own or if it's just merely a reflection 
of their upbringing. The second challenge that a cradle Christian has is worship burnout. Because by the time a cradle Christian graduates from high school, he or she has sat through hundreds of worship services and Bible school classes and youth group meetings and been on mission trips and is wondering if spiritual dullness can take over and worship becomes more habitual than it does heartfelt. The third challenge is shattered idealism. Those who grew up in the church soon learn that the church is not a perfect place. And a cradle Christian realizes that those who attend church on Sundays don't always practice what they hear on Mondays. And David Faust writes, cradle Christians see the church up close and personal, and sometimes it is not pretty. The fourth challenge is top that testimony. Top that testimony. One who grew up in the church might feel inferior to those who've had a more dramatic conversion process and they feel like their testimonies don't mean anything. They didn't have a dramatic conversion process and they feel like they just have no impact whatsoever. Many of you sitting here cannot remember your life without Jesus Christ. I like the one guy, the one Christian guy who quipped and prayed, Dear Lord, I've never been drunk, I've never been on drugs, I've never drunk an alcohol, I've never been in jail, I've never been unfaithful to my wife, but if you can use me in spite of these weaknesses, here I am. <laughs> and I think that's how a lot of us may feel if you grew up in the church. You feel like, I, I've had no dramatic conversion experience, I've really never had anything happen that was like Saul's to Paul, and so I'm not sure I have much of a testimony. But not all Christians are going to have a dramatic life change story. So you should not feel guilty, but also you should not negate the stories of those who've had dramatic conversion experience. The Bible makes it clear we all have sinned. And without the saving grace of Jesus Christ, we cannot enter into the heaven that God has prepared. And I think that one of the issues that many Christians battle, maybe very subtly, is the temptation to fake Christianity and not allow Jesus Christ to truly make a significant difference in our lives at times. So no matter how you came to Christ, maybe it was a dramatic fashion, or maybe it's just daily learning about Jesus as you grew up, how the birth occurred is not as significant as the life that is being produced by it. Scott Hayes was raised in church, in this church. His parents, Bill and Carolyn Hayes, Bill and Carolyn are over there. They are longtime members here, but Scott is a lifer here. And for a period of four years, he did his undergraduate college, and he wasn't here. But otherwise, Scott has been here in this church all of his life. His wife, Cheryl, was baptized here. And now her parents, Dick and Charlene Johnson, they are baptized here. They're members here. Scott and Cheryl got married in, in the church back in the early 1990s. Their daughter, Emily, who's now a student at Shawnee State, has been raised in our church. Scott has been active in men's groups and Bible classes, leading them. He's been active on our worship team. He's been a deacon in our church. He's now serving as one of our church elders. And his conversion has simply been a day-by-day growing-up process. A preacher from the early 1900s named Henry Emerson Fosdick wisely said, there is something better than bringing the prodigal back from the far country, and that is keeping him at home in a right relationship with the father. There is something better than bringing the prodigal back from the far country, and that is keeping him at home in a right relationship with the father. So there's one other truth I want you to see in Scripture that we, as we think about valuing stories of life change, and it is this. We all should have some expectations for a changed life. We all should have some expectations for a changed life. Now, while some lives are changed dramatically because of a relationship with Jesus Christ, most are changed incrementally. The Christian life is both a gift and a growth. It is a gift in that we receive the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit to live within us at our baptism. But it is also a growth as we take on the responsibility to continually feed ourselves upon the Word of God, to surround ourselves with other followers of Christ, and to daily be learning to practice our faith. If I showed you a picture of an eight-pound newborn, you would be very excited for the parents and probably compliment the infant's appearance. But that joy presupposes the normal growth of a child. 
Now, on the other hand, if I showed you a picture of a five-year-old who still weighed only eight pounds and is not talking or walking, there would be great sympathy, not great joy. It is expected a healthy baby will grow and be transformed from an infant into a child and later into an adult. And if that doesn't occur, something is seriously wrong and there's going to be much disappointment versus great rejoicing. Here's a picture of my holding Penelope Brown. That's David and Lynn Brown's daughter. She was five months old on that day. This was Valentine's Day. My wife was babysitting Penelope at our house on Valentine's Day, and I was home for lunch. Now, there is one similarity Penelope and I have. (laughs) I don't know if you can spot it or not. The glare alone should give it away. Uh, Neither of us have any hair, but there is a difference. Penelope will grow hair. That's the difference. She will have the ability to grow hair. It is sad when people have been Christians for many years, but there has been very little spiritual growth in their lives. They don't know much more about the Bible than when they first became a Christian. Their thinking is as shallow and as worldly as it ever was. Their behavior isn't much different than when they first came to know the Lord. Or there's not much distinctive about them other than they maybe go to church two or three times a month. They have been reborn, but they have not allowed Jesus Christ to transform their lives. And being a Christian isn't just about getting us into heaven. It's about getting heaven into us here. Being a Christian isn't just about getting us into heaven. It's about getting heaven into us here. It's about being transformed and looking more like Jesus as we mature in our faith. It's about having deep enough roots that we can withstand storms that come and cause troubles in our lives and the temptations that are inevitably going to beat upon our lives. So I want to give you three expectations that it seems God would have for us as we grow in our relationship with him. There is an expectation that we are transformed mentally. That we are transformed mentally. You know how this happens? A growing Christian is saturating his mind with God's word. First sermon I preached this year was how to study the Bible on your own. And we emphasized a daily reading of God's word. How are you doing with that? We use this slide. The Bible is meant to be bread for daily use, not cake for special occasions. The Bible is meant to be bread for daily use, not just cake for special occasions. In a world that focuses on emotions, we need a standard that is reliable because our emotions can fluctuate. If your marriage is based on emotions rather than a commitment, you are probably on some shaky ground. I always loved what the late Southern Baptist preacher W.A. Criswell used to say. He said after 50 years of marriage, he said, sometimes I love my wife so much I could just eat her up, and by the next day I usually wished I had. (laughs) Christianity is not a feel-good religion. Christianity is a relationship with Jesus Christ and a commitment to following him and his word. So as we mature in the Christian life, as we become transformed more into the image of Christ, we should move from being emotionally driven to being scripturally driven. 1 Peter 1.14 in the message says, Don't lazily slip back into those old grooves of evil, doing just what you feel like doing. You didn't know any better then, but you do now. Why do you think it is that Satan bombards us with temptations that are appealing to us? He knows our emotional drive. He understands how our minds feel versus sometimes how we should think. Why would a man have an affair with a woman at work when he has a beautiful wife and two kids at home? He'll say something like, well, the electricity flowed, so we followed our hearts. It was emotionally driven. It was not scripturally driven. And folks, spiritual life change will not occur without a firm foundation on the word of God. When Saul had his conversion experience, he basically ended up afterwards disappearing for about two years, and a man named Barnabas pulled him aside and encouraged him and kept teaching him Scripture. In Acts 9.26, it says, When he came to Jerusalem, that's Saul who became Paul, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. Of course they were afraid of him. The day before, he had tried to murder them. 
And now he's in church with them. Of course they're scared, verse 27. But Barnabas took him, brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord, and the Lord had spoken to him. How in Damascus he preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and he debated with the Hellenistic Jews, but they tried to kill him. When the believers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea, sent him off to Tarsus. I love what this next verse says. It's actually a little bit of humor in this verse. Luke says, Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace. They're like, we are so glad he is out of our town. We don't know what was going on this man. He's basically a spiritual schizophrenia nut. And we don't want him around. And so when he got out, there, because you know what? When that happens, when there's a dramatic conversion experience in somebody's life, we just sometimes don't know how to handle it. And so the church enjoyed a time of peace, and it says it was strengthened. So he first scared the other followers of Christ, and then the church had peace. Well, there's also an expectation that we are transformed morally. Not only should we be transformed mentally, we should be transformed morally. Ephesians 5.3 says, But among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's people. Life change occurs as we grow from yielding to our worldly desires and then becoming more like Jesus in our character. Holiness is not only defined by what we don't do, like don't get drunk, don't use drugs, don't lie, don't use profanity, although we should not do all those things. Holiness is also imitating God's character because we're trying to become like our Heavenly Father. We're his children, and as we grow more in our faith, we should look more like him. It's imitating God's character because we are God's children, and so we ought to act like we're God's children, and we should try to imitate the Father as much as we can. Some people post, even some Christians post things on social media that use profanity and derogatory remarks, and they shouldn't do that, but making changes in our lives is not instantaneous but it should be progressive. Maybe you brought into your life with Christ some profane habits, the mouth needed some cleaning, and it takes some time for those words to be removed from your vocabulary. It takes time for those words to be replaced with some new ones. But when a one-year-old who is trying to just learn to walk stumbles and falls, we giggle and we encourage him to get back up. There's no harm done. But if a 10-year-old repeatedly stumbles and falls, it is probably a sign of a more serious problem. Are you cleaning up your mind? Clean up your speech, clean up your habits, clean up your social media. Now, the bad thing is that sinful nature that lives within us, it will come out sometimes. It's not completely dead at times. It suddenly will resurrect its ugly head, and sometimes we'll say something we didn't mean to say, or sometimes we'll do something we didn't mean to do. I remember when our son was growing up, every once in a while he would sass me. From the ages of 12 to 16, I was sure that one of us was not going to live. I'm not sure which one it was going to be. Adam was a great kid growing up, but just from that four- to five-year period, we just butted heads continually. I know none of your other parents ever had any of that problem with your kids, right? But we just butted heads, and I finally concluded that sinful nature from ages 12 to 16 had reared its ugly head, that sinful nature that obviously comes from the mother's side of the family, and uh, (laughs) you have to deal with that and learn how to control that. There's also an expectation that we are transformed relationally, that we get transformed relationally. Life change means you go from being self-centered to being others-centered. Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4, you do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves and looking to your own, not to your own interests, but each to you the interest of others. One of the most difficult lessons for children to learn is to be unselfish because they think the world revolves around them. They have a word that preschoolers can learn very quickly. You know what that word is? Mine. It is mine. They have to be taught to counter that nature, and they have to be taught to share. The same is very true with us in our Christian life. Spiritual life change does not occur without a shift in our thinking of self to others because it's my needs, my music, my seat, my time, my child honor. And so we have to be cautious not to hold grudges when we don't get our way. 
Dave Hagler works as an umpire in a recreational softball league in Boulder, Colorado. He writes about being pulled over for speeding on his way to an umpire training class, and he tried to talk the officer out of giving him the ticket. But the officer was very firm, and he handed Dave the ticket, and the officer curtly said, if you don't like it, you can take it to court. Fast forward a few weeks to when softball season started. Dave was umpiring behind the plate, and the first batter up to the plate was the police officer who had given him the ticket. Dave said it was an awkward moment when we recognized each other. And the policeman stepped up to the batter's box, and he asked, asked Dave, said, how'd everything go with that ticket? Without missing a beat, Hagler said, you better swing at everything. As we grow in Christ, as life change occurs, hatred and bitterness should minimize and love and forgiveness should increase. In his work, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis wrote, If conversion to Christianity makes no improvement to a man's outward actions, if he continues to be just as snobbish or spiteful or envious or ambitious as he was before, then I think we must suspect that his conversion was largely imaginary. Is your conversion imaginary? While the followers of Jesus were initially shocked at Saul's conversion, as time progressed, so did his life in Jesus Christ. This man who once breathed out murderous threats against Christians was writing about the Lord and helping to start new churches in his part of the world. What area of your life are you allowing Jesus Christ to change you right now? What area are you maybe not allowing him to enter right now? And why? Maybe say, oh, I'm okay, I'm going to make it to heaven. That's great, but will you get some heaven here in you and allow Jesus to change you here? Jesus already demonstrated for us that very concept, the very concept of being unselfish and doing something for others. He left heaven for earth, took up his cross, died for our sins, and then resurrected to prove his power. Our stories can become his if we allow him to transform us. We have the gift from Jesus of forgiveness. How are we doing with the growth? As communion is being distributed this morning, hold those emblems, and then we will partake together. Let's pray. Father, it is true that you expect us to grow, to grow in our faith in Jesus Christ and to become more like him. And God, sometimes that sinful nature that does still live within us, sometimes it, it creeps in and it reminds us that um, uh, we still can sin and we still can forget what you've done for us. So God, help us during those times that when we want to base something on feeling that we really need to base it on Scripture. Help us to dig deeper into your word, to, to look at it and just try to understand it more. And God, put that desire within us to be a better learner of your word. And God, we thank you for the examples of people like the Apostle Paul who has converted so dramatically. But we thank you for examples like the Scott Hayes of this world who just daily learned about Jesus and have grown up in him. And God, no matter where any of us fall within those two ranges, may we realize it's still our responsibility to keep growing in you and to look more like you every day. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.